try it now. Now? How's that? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, is the screen going to work? That's the other thing. Okay, well, it's good to be here with you at Harlan tonight. At my age, it could be any place. <laughs> so I don't want to dispel a rumor right now. No, I'm not as old as the dinosaurs, okay? I think Ron Payne started that rumor. Where's Ron? He's back there. He's the guy you see about the books. If I don't have the answers on something, he'll have it in one of the books back here and he'll decide to help you out. Well, dinosaurs, it seems like the favorite subject of a lot of people, especially since the release of the movie Jurassic Park back in the 1990s. They keep showing it on TV over and over again. And it's been an interest of mine for a long time, too. But tonight, the main question that I'd like to address is, how do dinosaurs fit in with the Bible? Um, last summer, I ran into a gentleman and had a discussion with him. He thought the creationists didn't believe in dinosaurs. Well, I think there's enough evidence to show that these guys did indeed live. The entire Earth's crust is littered with bones of all sorts of animals, dinosaurs being one of them. There have been some creationists in the past that didn't know what to do with all those bones out there, and they, you know, I heard one guy say, well, I think God just put them out there to test our faith. Well, no, that, that kind of answer doesn't fly in today's science-minded world, so we have to look a little closer at the subject. That's what we're going to do tonight. Now, they've classified some 1,000 different types of dinosaurs, but I think there's probably some overlap there. Every time someone discovers a new type of dinosaur and it looks a little bit different than something that has been found before, they give it a new name. So a lot of times it might be just the juvenile of a species already discovered or maybe a different sex or, or something slightly different. So they have all these thousand names or so. I suspect the actual number is something like five or six hundred, something like that. But anyway, we want to find out tonight how the Bible evidence contradicts evolutionary theory and how I think the Bible evidence, scientific evidence, makes a better case. Now, according to evolutionary theory, Dinosaurs first evolved some 230 to 200 million years ago and went extinct all of a sudden about 65 million years ago. So we want to look at that tonight. We want to ask the question, what killed them off? Where did they go? What about dragons? I'm sure most of you have noticed that there seems to be a similarity between dragons and dinosaurs. So we're going to take a quick look at that tonight. So, everybody, of course, wants to know, well, what about the biggest dinosaurs because they're the most fascinating and everything. So that's what I'm going to start off with. There was a dinosaur called Argentinosaurus. It was discovered in 1993 in, of all places, Argentina. <laughs> and uh, probably the largest animal to ever, the largest land animal to ever walk the earth. Now this guy was about 90 feet long. Can you imagine that? 90 feet? He came in at an estimated 110 tons. Think about it. That's 220,000 pounds. When you think of a semi-truck trailer, it'll carry a gross of about 40,000 pounds. This guy, it would take about more than four or five semi-truck trailers just to carry this one animal. So this is the biggest dinosaur that's ever been discovered to date. Um, so let's look at the other end of the scale. At this tiny end, we have the Lagosuchus. Now it's looking more like a lizard to me, but we we'll classify it as a dinosaur. Now this, uh, this guy was about 12 to 16 inches long. Paleontologists think that he fed 
on insects and perhaps some small animals. But most dinosaurs came in <coughs> in the middle someplace. Everybody is familiar with T. rex, Tyrannosaurus rex. The first T. rex skeleton was discovered in 1908. And it's interesting that even though this one's so famous, probably because it's such a fierce predator, that no complete skeleton of a T. rex has been found. But here's what we think we know about him. The longest one up to about 40, 49 feet long, and uh, it was the largest carnosaur, that is the largest meat-eating dinosaur, weighed about seven or eight tons. Now the debate still goes on as to whether he was a true predator or just a scavenger. Of course, in Jurassic Park, they showed him as a scavenger chasing that jeep at about 25 miles an hour. Uh, but, you know, Jurassic Park had it wrong. T. rex didn't live in the Jurassic period, but in the Cretaceous. But somehow, Cretaceous Park didn't have quite the same brain as Jurassic Park. So, you know, well, there's Hollywood for you, okay? Well, anyway, T. rex was uh, heavier than a bull elephant and uh, had fangs six inches long, and I think that's the fascination there, those six-inch fangs. Well, let's look at a few other examples. Uh, Parasaurolophus is another interesting one, 33 feet long. He weighed over three tons. One of the duck-billed dinosaurs, you still don't know what that projection on the back of his head was for. Some people think of it. Resonance chamber, a resonance chamber for his voice, but we don't know. There's another interesting one called the Chasmosaurus, one of the Ceratopsians. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Triceratops, which is in the same family. This guy was about 17 feet long and um, weighed about two tons. The difference between this guy and the Triceratops was the neck frill was bigger in this one, for one thing. You notice the colors on this, on all these dinosaurs, well, we don't really know what their colors were. So different books, different theme parks, you'll see them painted different colors. Here's one I wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley <laughs> or a dark jungle or something. Acrocanthosaurus. If anything, is the archetypical dragon. I think it's this guy with the spikes along his back and the teeth. He came in up to 40 feet long, 7,000 pounds. Needless to say, one of the meat eaters. Now, classified along with the dinosaurs is the flying reptiles. The pterodactyl wasn't particularly large, about two and a half foot wingspan. But uh, as part of the pterosauria, the flying reptiles, usually classified loosely with the dinosaurs because they were reptiles. We think that uh, dinosaurs were reptiles because of the fact that they had scales, they laid eggs. But uh, some people think, well, maybe they were warm-blooded. Well, we don't know for sure. We don't have any living examples. Well, I don't think we do. And then there are the marine reptiles, also loosely classified with the dinosaurs. This is a, a reconstruction of a plesiosaur showing the fossil bones put together. And we think this is what the plesiosaur would have looked like. We probably fed on fish. Now, I did bring one dinosaur fossil with me tonight. And this is a mosasaur. It's uh, the jaws of a mosasaur embedded in sandstone. And was somewhat similar to the plesiosaur. Sorry, I don't have a plesiosaur to go. But the evolutionists say this is 65 million years old. But I'll That's leave this up here. I think it's kind of interesting. If anybody wants to take a look at it afterwards, you're welcome to do so. Let's try 
So all we know then about dinosaurs is from their fossil remains. So what did they leave behind? Well, the skeleton, of course, coprolite, that's dinosaur poo, um, skin impressions, uh, dinosaur tracks, and the occasional dinosaur mummy. Well, what's a dinosaur mummy? Well, the dinosaur mummy is not like an Egyptian mummy where the body is wrapped in cloth and buried and all this kind of stuff. No, a dinosaur mummy is where the entire creature is fossilized, preserved in scum. Not too long ago, I read a book about a almost complete Allosaurus that was discovered in eastern Montana. And the paleontologists had a really hard time getting it out of the rock and took several years to dig it out and transport it to the lab and everything. It's quite fascinating, but of course quite heavy being solid stone. <clears throat> so all we know then is from what we find in the ground. Most dinosaur bones are jumbled up and incomplete. Here's an example of what they may look like when they're first discovered. And it sometimes takes years of chisel work to get the bones out of the rock. And the way that they're all jumbled up and usually incomplete suggests that the bones were disturbed after the animal had died and at least partially decomposed. Well, after the bones are chiseled out of the rock, then they may look like this. This is a stegosaur. I believe this is in the Denver Museum of Natural Science. But notice how it's still flattened. Most all the bones that we find are flattened, as if they had been buried by some sudden catastrophe. Well, then the bones have to be reassembled in the way the paleontologists think the animal looked like, using wires and rods they put them together and get the stegosaur skeleton. Then they can reconstruct what they think the animal looked like. Of course, we still don't know a lot about him, like what were those plates on his back for? We don't know for sure. They make a lot of speculations, but nobody can prove it one way or another. Well, the question is, what happened to the dinosaurs? The most popular theory is mass extinction impact by a meteor or a comet or an asteroid or something like that, although over 60 theories have been proposed. Some of them plausible, some of them downright silly. But the theory goes that these things were killed off all of a sudden by some giant catastrophe. And this is the most popular theory. Um, the problem that I have with most of these theories is why only the dinosaurs? Why weren't all the other animals killed off too? Well, maybe this is what really happened. <laughs> Actually, we believe that most of them were killed off in a giant cataclysm. As Ken Ham likes to say, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down, laid down by water all over the earth. This is another example from the Denver Museum showing a mass burial, mass extinction of fish. This is only part of the rock slab that was recovered, but hundreds, maybe thousands of fish were all of a sudden killed off in the middle of whatever they were doing one day all at once. Could this have been something associated with Noah's flood? was. But we might ask the question of how did they arrive at a date of 65 million years ago for their extinction? Well, it's part of what they call the standard geologic column in which, well, it goes back some 560, 570 million years to the present and in each and in standard column, they assign periods in which they think the prevalent life existed. In, uh, as far as dinosaurs go, we're looking mainly at the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. Um, up in 
this area here, and perhaps the Triassic when they first started to evolve according to evolutionary theory. And then dinosaur extinction happened right there by something, according to their theory. But how did they get to that date? Well, all of the dating schemes are based on assumptions. And there's one fundamental underlying assumption uh, that I'm going to talk about. I don't have time to go into all the dating and stuff, but uniformitarianism is the underlying <coughs> principle that geology is based upon these days. If you haven't heard that word, it means the assumption that all geological processes have occurred in the past at the same rates as they do today. The main proponent of that theory was Charles Lyell in the 19th century, he came up with the slogan, the present is the key to the past. That is to say, whatever's happening today is what's always happened at the same rates as today. And so if we take today's rates and we project them backward, we come to these millions and millions of years and they arrive at the 55 million year extinction date. But I want to take a look at some evidences that suggest that dinosaurs have lived much more recently than 65 million years ago. I want to take a look to start with at some ancient literature. In the 5th century BC, there was a Greek historian by the name of Herodotus. In 440 BC, he wrote the history of Herodotus. And um, on a trip to Arabia, while he's doing research for his writings, he visited a sign, uh, excuse me, a site that was famous for what they called winged serpents. Now the usage of the term serpent has changed over the years. Today when we say serpent, we usually think of a snake. But back in ancient times, a serpent was often a flying reptile. Later on, it started to be applied to land-based reptiles too, but here he's talking about winged serpents. And he says that he visited the site of this gorge where there are giant heaps of bones from these winged serpents. And they told him the bones were caused by killing off these serpents by their enemies a bird called the ibis. The only other thing that uh, was significant that he reported was the fact that these serpents had wings that were membranes like a bat. Let's take a look at another piece of ancient literature. In the first century AD, there lived a Greek historian by the name of Apollonius of Tyana. Now, Tyana was in the Roman province of Cappadocia in Asia Minor. Uh, we don't know much about Apollonius except from other writers, but he talks about these dragons of enormous size, he calls them, that inhabited the swamps and mountains of India. And he says that they were up to 30 cubits, that is, 45 feet long. They were of various colors. All had scales. Some had crests on their heads. And some had serrated backs, like this solidosaurus that I'm picturing here. He says they gave off a terrible hiss and lived in the water at least part of the time. He also talked about the Indian people hunting the dragon, and sometimes the dragons won. <laughs> well, skeptics dismiss these kind of stories as pure fiction, something you tell around campsites to scare little children and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but actually these portrayals are remarkably consistent from culture to culture <coughs> around the world. I have time just to give you a, a few here, for instance, the British Chronicles have many accounts of uh, encounters with reptilian monsters. About 200 different encounters 
recorded in the British Isles in ancient times in um, England, Scotland, and Wales. I'd like to take a look at just two or three of those. Here's an example that comes from County Suffolk, Suffolk in 1405. And I think it's the most accurate description we have. It says, close to the town of Burris, near Sudbury, there's lately appeared to the great herd of the countryside a dragon, vast in body, with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a tail extending to an enormous length. Having slaughtered the shepherd of a flock, it devoured many sheep. After an unsuccessful attempt by local archers to kill the beast due to its impenetrable hide, in order to destroy him, all the country people around were summoned. But when the dragon saw that he was again to be assailed with arrows, he fled into a marsh or mare, and there hid himself among the long reeds, and never more was seen. Well, it sounds similar to the Corythosaurus that I have pictured here with the crested head. Let's move on to the year 1449, also in the English countryside, according to one of their chronicles. In September of that year, two giant reptiles were seen fighting along a riverbank. One was described as black, the other as reddish and spotted. After they fought for about an hour, one of them retreated to his lair. The scene became known as Sharp Fight Meadow after that. <clears throat> Books from the 16th century listed several animals resembling dinosaurs as still being alive. In particular, there was a Swiss naturalist by the name of Conrad Gessner who wrote a treatise called Historiae Animalium, the history of animals. He wrote this between 1551 and 58. And in it, he had a chapter called On Dragons, in which he described them matter-of-factly like, yeah, sure, everybody knows that they exist. Uh, this is his one of the illustrations in his book. I don't know how accurate it is, but it sort of remi is sort of reminiscent of the flying reptile called Scaphognathus, one of the, the pterosaurs. In 1572, the Italian naturalist Ulysses Aldrovanus describes an encounter with uh, a dragon, so-called, in the Italian countryside. It seems one day an Italian herdsman was leading an ox cart down a country road. He was behind the cart. All of a sudden the oxen came to a standstill and wouldn't move. So he goes around to the front of the oxen to see what's holding him up. And here he sees what he describes as a strange little dragon. Well. He had a big stick. He killed it with a stick, reported it to Aldermanus. Aldermanus said, yep, it's definitely a reptile, probably a baby. OK, I'm going to skip that one and just say that there have been dragons in legend and literature all over the world, remarkably consistent in their portrayals, Asia, Africa, North America, the Middle East. And, uh, I wish I had time to talk about more, but we've got to move on. I want to talk about dinosaurs and rock art. Uh, <laughs> illustrations left by people who apparently saw them because they knew what they looked like. There are two types that we want to look at. One's the pictograph and the other is the petroglyph. A pictograph is an image that's painted on rock. A petroglyph is carved in rock. This is Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah. Have any of you ever visited this particular park? Nobody? One. There's a bridge there called Kachina Bridge. And uh, we were down there a few years ago. While we were there, I remember that, hey, somebody reported that there's a 
pictograph here that looks something like a dinosaur. So I went and asked the ranger, and he said, oh, yeah, it's down. And he told me where it was and everything. And I said, well, what do you think it, it was or is? Do you think it's a dinosaur? And he says, no, I don't think so. The tail's too heavy. Well, what do you think it is? Well, I don't know. Well, it's on this picture. I don't know if you can see it. It's very faint. It took me a while to find it, even knowing where it was. So I've outlined it. <laughs> now what does it look like? Well, to me, it at least is reminiscent of a sauropod dinosaur. Yes, it does have a big tail. Maybe it's exaggerated. I don't know. There's another good example that we have in the Grand Canyon. This is a petroglyph, and it could be in Edmontosaurus or something like that. Can you see the screen over there? Okay. All right, I'm not standing in the way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we know that it's at least several hundred years because of the rock varnish. Now, the rock varnish is a, a combination of bacterial and chemical action that puts this dark varnish over the rock face over a period of hundreds of years. And we know that it's not a modern carbon because of this little spot here. It's a bullet hole. Somebody took a shot at it. So if it was a modern carving, that's the color it would be. So we don't know who made this. Um, in the previous one here, this, this was made by the Anasazi people who lived there between 400 and 1300 AD. We don't know about this one, but presumably from the the same time period. Um, uh oh. Press the wrong button. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. All right. We want to take a look at artifacts from around the world. In particular, I find this one fascinating. In Cambodia, there's a temple at the, the uh, site called Angkor. Now this temple was built in 1186 AD. Um, it was built by the Khmer people. And at one time the area boasted a population of some 2 million people. But the site was abandoned in the, the 1200s due to an outbreak of malaria and invasion by the Vietnamese. So this temple was completely abandoned to the jungle. It was totally overgrown. It was only and uh, rediscovered in 1860. The interesting thing is, the temple is laid out, it's a Hindu temple, it was laid out to, um, in the same pattern as the constellation Draco, the dragon. But it's what's inside that's the most fascinating. In here are hundreds of carvings of different things, including a bunch of animals, but the one that I'm interested in looks like this. Interesting, huh? Now, if this was carved in 1186 AD, how did they know what I believe is a Stegosaurus? How did they know what he looked like? Well, the evolutionists say, well, uh, they saw some bones of this guy someplace and they imagined what it would look like and made a carving. I find that a little hard to believe since paleontologists have been working for the last 150 years trying to figure out what these guys look like. The other theory is, well, our uh, evolutionary ancestors millions and millions of years ago saw these. They were ingrained in the genes which were passed on over 65 million years and so they remember them from the genetic memory. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, how did these guys know what they looked like if they had seen them? The same applies to these dinosaur figurines found in Acamboro, Mexico. The people that lived there were known as the Chupacuaro culture. They lived there from 800 BC to 200 AD. In 1945, an archaeologist and some others were digging around that site, and they came across some 11,000 figurines that were buried. Among them were a number of figurines that looked like this. 
on the left looks like a sauropod dinosaur, perhaps a Diplodocus or Patasaurus. On the right, what looks like a Saltosaurus. Now here's the Wikipedia picture of a Saltosaurus. Looks very similar. Again, if these people hadn't seen them, how would they know what they looked like? Now a number of investigations have been conducted to try to date these things. And they come up with a maximum date using radiocarbon and thermal luminescent dating of 4,350 years. <clears throat> well, if uh, they're no more than 4,353 years old, how did the people get such accurate renderings of them if they had died off 65 million years ago? Here's another one that was found at the same site. Again, what does it remind you of? Yeah, Stegosaurus. There's another interesting set of finds from the nation of Peru. The Nazca people lived there from about 400 to 700 AD in the um, well-known Atacama Desert. And the left behind these burial stones. They were first discovered in the 16th century by a Spanish priest, but more recently there was a Dr. Cabrera who was a physician from Lima, Peru. He started collecting these and he collected thousands of these and I think it was uh, yeah, 11,000 of these he collected uh, and put in a museum near Lima. A number of them are like this. They, they depict dinosaurs. The right on, on the right hand side there looks very much to me like a triceratops. Mm -hmm. Above it perhaps a Psittacosaurus. On the left, some guy's having a disagreement with what looks like a sauropod. <laughs> well maybe sauropods weren't just veggie sources, as they said in Jurassic Park. We don't know. <laughs> well, the controversy surrounding this is that skeptics charge that they're all fake because there's a guy down there that is making replicas of these things using a hacksaw blade. Well, uh, on, on investigation, the ones that this guy is duplicating are far inferior to the original ones. Plus, if you look at them, under a microscope, you can see in the grooves where he sawed off the rock, sawed off the rock, are bits of metal from the hacksaw blade. So, I don't think so. Well, here's another interesting artifact. This is the Palestrina mosaic laid by an Italian artist about AD 100. It depicts scenes along the Nile River in Egypt, but in particular, I'm interested in the upper right-hand corner showing Ethiopian warriors hunting some kind of reptilian animal. I don't know what it is. The Greek letters there spell out crocodile leopard. What was a crocodile leopard? Well, we don't know. Um, but it sort of reminds me of this guy, a Mosasaurus, was discovered in, again, Argentina fairly recently, 1979. Could have grown to about 10 feet in length and weighed, or when he was fully grown, I should say. Or another possibility was the Diadectus. I don't know. There's probably neither of these, but these look fairly close to it. I think there's more research we may come up with the answer to that one. Regardless, artifacts like this are found around the world. I've shown on this map 33 different locations. Uh, most of the inhabited world has had, or have uh, found some kind of artifacts like this. In fact, dinosaur fossils have been found on all seven continents, including Antarctica. So I've shown 33 different locations where they found different things here. I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to talk about some un 
unusual fossil finds. Some unusual fossils like this one. In 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer was excavating a T. rex in the Hell Creek Formation of Eastern Montana. And uh, as they were excavating this, you know, they wrapped the bones in burlap and plaster and, and then they get really heavy and they're hard to transport. Well, they were transporting some of these by helicopter. One of them was too big to get in, so they had to break it. When they broke it open, what did they find inside? But fresh looking dinosaur tissue, including <laughs> elastic tissue and what appeared to be red blood cells. They could even take one of the blood vessels and squeeze liquid out of it. The upper right one there is a cross section of the bone looking like it just came from the butcher shop. But this is supposed to be 65 million years old. And because of the long ages paradigm, she couldn't accept what I think is obvious. There's something wrong with that date. But she said, quote, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. I said to the technician, the bones, after all, are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Indeed, how could they? She performed exhaustive tests on all the tissue samples from the blood cells and confirmed that, yep, they're real. Real dinosaur tissue. In fact, since that 2005 discovery, more of these have been found, and she herself even found another one like it. So, and this guy has trouble keeping a turkey sandwich for three weeks. 65 million years? Wow, that's a stretch. <laughs> There's another interesting fossil find. According to the displays you see in museums and the standard geologic column, we've got the age of dinosaurs, the dinosaurs went out, and we've got the age of mammals. And although they say there is some overlap between them, they portray them as very distinct. But here in China, in I think it was 2004, um, let's see. 2005, some paleontologists discovered a tiny dinosaur inside a now extinct mammal. The dinosaur that this mammal ate was a Psittacosaurus, a baby one, but it kind of belies the picture that we have that there was one age that died out and then there was something else. But this, among a lot of other evidence, including places where mammal bones and dinosaur bones are all jumbled up together. And it goes against the evolutionary picture that says that there were this ancient age, they died out and didn't survive. Here's another interesting fossil find. Dracorex Hogwartsia. It means King Dragon of Hogwarts. That <laughs> <laughs> Name sound familiar? Mm. Yep, it's from the Harry Potter novel. <laughs> well, they found only the skeleton. Uh, I'm sorry, only the skull. They didn't find the skeleton, but the paleontologists, including Jack Horner, the evolutionist of the Museum of the Rockies, said he thought that it was probably a young Pachycephalosaurus. So they mated it with a skeleton of the Pachycephalosaurus. And if that's correct, it would have looked like the one on the right there. It now sits in the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. But I thought this was really interesting because of the skull. But these bony spikes sticking out all over it sure reminds me of a dragon. Now, have you all seen The Hobbit Part Two: The Desolation of Smog? There's smog 
this isn't a real clear picture, it's a clear slide it's fine, but smog sure looks like the Hogwartsian skull. Take it for what it's worth, but I think it's I think it's very uh, interesting that it's so similar. Well, in Jurassic Park, of course, they were cloning dinosaurs. And the story goes that they found mosquitoes trapped in amber, and uh, the mosquito had bitten a dinosaur before it was trapped, and so some of the dinosaur DNA was still there. They extracted it. Even though it was degraded, they filled in the missing parts with frog DNA, and presto, they've got all these dinosaurs. Well, is that really possible? Well, it turns out recently, some paleontologists in, um, let's see, I don't have down where they found that, but anyway, they found a squished mosquito that still had blood cells in it from having uh, from its last meal. They dated the rock formation at 46 million years. Okay, so the question is then, could they extract DNA from this mosquito and clone something from it? The answer is probably not. Uh, the DNA molecule is very unstable, it begins to degrade very quickly, and even under the most ideal conditions, it couldn't possibly last for more than a few thousand years. And then, even if it was degraded, they tried to do what they did in Jurassic Park and substitute some more DNA in there. They would have to guess what part is missing, what sequence it has to be in, and so forth. Be very difficult, and so I don't see we're going to. I don't think we're going to see any dinosaurs being reproduced anytime soon. Okay, I'd like to go to the next section, which I call "Strange Animals of the Old Testament," in particular the Book of Job, chapter 40, where it talks about behemoth. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you and which feeds on the grass like an ox. What strength he has in his mind. What power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. Well, modern translators don't know what to do with this word behemoth. Usually they translate it hippopotamus. But I've been to Africa, I've seen hippos, and I've yet to see one with a tail like a cedar. <laughs> Us living in the Northwest, we know what a cedar looks like. I think it could be talking about perhaps something like this, a diplodocus or brachiosaurus, maybe another type of dinosaur, I don't know. But in chapter 41, it gives us even a better description of an animal called Leviathan. Now, Leviathan has traditionally been associated with the whale, so let's see if that really fits. Chapter 41, look, oops, can you pull out the Leviathan, Leviathan with a fish hook, or tie down his tongue with a rope? If you lay a hand on him, you'll remember the struggle and never do it again. <laughs> Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. Who dares open the doors of his mouth, ringed about with his fearsome teeth? His back has rows of shields, tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. Now, modern translations sometimes render this crocodile. It seems to fit in some respects but this is no ordinary crocodile. Well, back in the 60s, they first discovered a, a fossilized crocodile called Sarcosuchus imperator. Super croc. This is no ordinary crocodile. They found another one in the nation of Niger in 2001. This guy came in at 40 feet long, and he weighed 20,000 pounds. He had jaws that were six feet long, ringed with a hundred teeth each, 
an inch in length. And he had these uh, plates, these bony plates called scoots on his back that were actually intertwined. They overlapped so that, like the Bible says, no air could pass between. Could this be what Job is talking about? Well, I think it's the best candidate that we have to date. Let's go on with the description. It says, his snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from his nostrils as from a blood and cot over a fire of reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames dark from his mouth. And you're saying, what? A fire-breathing dragon? Oh, come on. Well, Super Croc, could he have had something like that? Super Croc had a cavity on his snout called a bullet. It was hollow. We don't know what it was for, but could it have been the source of smoke and fire? The nearest analog that we have on Earth today is called the bombardier beetle, which has a chemical reaction chamber on his hind end, and when enemies get too close, chemicals mix, and a hot boiling gas and liquid spurt out on his enemies. Well, could that have been the case with super crop? It's known that there are gases which, upon contact with air, spontaneously ignite. Could that have been the case here? We don't know, but it's worth thinking about. <clears throat> To finish up tonight, I'd like to ask the question, could some dinosaurs still be around? There have been persistent reports of something, and now I'm not talking about Sasquatch, <laughs> something in some of the jungles and remote areas of the world, the most famous of which I think is probably Okelium Bembe in the Congo, Africa. He's reported to live in a place called the Likawala Swamp. Now this swamp is 70,000 square miles of malaria and snake infested swampland. It's almost impenetrable. Uh, the natives don't even like going in there. In the wet season, you have to try to get a canoe in. In the dry season, you're tripping over tree roots, fighting off mosquitoes and all the rest of it. So it's really difficult to get in there, but the natives think there's something in there that looks like this. So when missionaries have shown them pictures of a sauropod dinosaur, they say, we're killing a and they don't want to have anything to do about to do with it. So there's a cryptozoologist, a um, person who studies unknown animals, from the University of Chicago, Dr. Roy Mackel, on an expedition and went down there Look for this guy, and uh, it was only partially successful. All they found were some tracks and places where the animal had been feeding. Um, but it was described by the natives as being a reddish brown with a long serpentine neck, larger than an elephant, with a long, powerful tail. So, uh, if you're interested in reading about it, he wrote a book called In Search of Mokelly and Membe. There's a, at least one copy in the King County Library system. Oh, this is in King County. Oh, well. <laughs> um, how about Papua New Guinea? There have been a number of reports from a place called Ambungi Island. Now, the south side of this island is unpopulated. People don't go there very often, but there have been spon uh, sporadic reports of some unknown animals there. This one here is uh, painted by the description of a guy who saw what appeared to be a sauropod dinosaur go through the water and into that cave shown there. It was described as having four legs, a small head, a long neck and tail, with dermal frills along his neck and back, estimated to be about 12 feet long, six to nine feet high, dark brown in color. A 
similar sighting was reported in that same area of a similar type of creature on land in 1999. Again, this animal was a reddish brown, had a dermal frill that is like the triangular plates on its tail, five toes, estimated nine feet long, and um, was seen eating plants. The only evidence left behind were tracks. But this picture shows only one type of reptilian that was sighted in this area. There have been reports of dinosaurs like theropods, in other words, like T-Rex, only smaller there. Well, as we come to the conclusion of this talk tonight, what does it really matter? Whether these guys were 65 million years old or 6,500, I mean, who cares? Well, if they were 65 million years old, somehow they seem to have survived without having evolved at all you know, over that 65 million years up until very recently and perhaps even today, or the date is totally wrong. Now, if the date is wrong, this throws the entire dating scheme of the geologic column into question. And if the geologic column is questionable, then I think we have a right to question evolution, because evolution requires millions and millions of years. Well, if you're interested in reading a little bit more about the Ica stones, I have a few copies of Secrets of the Ica stones and Nazca lines back there, written by Dr. Dennis Swift, who lives near Portland. He's made a number of trips down to Peru and written a book about the Ica stones. That about wraps it up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bruce. That was uh, very enjoyable. So I'm sure some folks have some questions about what uh, Bruce spoke about. If you do, raise your hand and I will bring the mic around so you can voice your question and get uh, Bruce's answer. In the meantime, did the uh, clipboards make it around? Did everybody get the chance to sign the clipboard if they want to? And uh, also, as I said, we will take a free love offering for those who want to contribute to this effort. And uh, so if the three... Um, you mentioned that the skin of the dinosaurs had scales yeah. as well as a leathery quality. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there a differentiation between one type of dinosaurs that had the scales and the other one that had the leathery quality? Yeah, we don't have enough skin impressions, enough evidence to make any real conclusions on that. Um, if I recall that Allosaurus mummy that they found, I think that had scales all over it, but there may have been some types that did not, um, particularly underneath. For instance, the flying reptiles, even though uh, the reptiles evidently did not have scales, but probably had skins more like a bat or something like that. <coughs> uh, I'm fascinated by the discovery that Mary Schweitzer made of the dinosaurs with the uh, fresh blood and DNA. Uh, actually, you can go to the University Museum in Bozeman and see a display there that, that looks like where they found the dinosaur. But I'm curious about Mary Schweitzer. She's been accused of being a creationist because she reported this information. But she, she claims to be a Christian but denies being a creationist. I don't know any more than that about her. Do you have any information that explains how she handles the, this issue? Yeah. I don't uh, recall a, a lot more details, except that she's apparently a theistic evolutionist. She believes in God, but believes in evolution also. So um, uh, most of this 
scientists that I'm aware of are busy trying to figure out how dinosaur blood cells and DNA can last 65 million years. That's where their efforts are being concentrated these days. Uh, sorry, that's all, that's all the details I can remember at the moment. Um, I have a question. The, uh, I thought a number of years ago that they did a, a, a review of one of the hearts they had found and found it was a four chamber, which would make it a warm blooded creature. Do you have any more background on that? I'm sorry, I can't comment on that, but I suspect that may be one of the reasons why some people think that dinosaurs may have been warm blooded. So the, the debate on that goes on, but uh, I'm not aware of that. So if dinosaurs were at least somewhat common up to several hundred years ago, what do you think has caused the sharp decrease in population or extinction of yeah. them recently? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, probably two different uh, causes. One, notice that they are probably smaller than before the flood, so probably they didn't adapt as well to the new climate after the flood. And secondly, they were probably killed off by man. I didn't take time to show the example, but um, there are stories of people going out and killing these things off because they were preying on their poultry, their ducks and geese, hens and so forth. And so these are enemies like wolves. People killed off all the wolves in North America, and they were only re recently reintroduced because, of course, they competed with their livestock. So most of these, we think, were killed off by hunters. There are a lot of stories of encounters with each other. dragons and so, so forth that I didn't take time to go into, but that's the gist of it. Uh, you know how you said that you can't clone a dinosaur with a blood? Can you use that tissue to clone it? Well, you'd have to have a complete strand of DNA. Um, I'm not a biologist. Maybe somebody who knows more about biology could speak to that. But I do know that the, there are problems with cloning. Does anybody remember Dolly the sheep and how Dolly was cloned. The problem was the cells when they're cloned, they're old. They're already partially degraded. So Dolly lived a rather short life. So I think Jurassic Park was a real stretch of the imagination showing how they all of a sudden had all these dinosaurs and they were laying eggs and all this stuff. So, yes. Wouldn't we, excuse me, wouldn't we have to assume that uh, male and female kinds of dinosaurs would have been on the ark. Yes, we would have. And I was hoping somebody would ask that. I didn't have time to go into it in the slideshow, but the question comes up. Were dinosaurs on the ark? What does the Bible say? It says, take two or possibly seven of every created kind, put them on the ark. Would that have included dinosaurs? Yeah. Would it have included Arg Argentinosaurus? No. Hmm. Well, would, as uh, this gentleman mentioned, uh, reptiles grow throughout their lifespan. Argentinosaurus, the species, or the one that they found, that big monster, of course, probably was growing during his lifetime, but would he have been, had to have gone on the ark? Not necessarily. How about small dinosaurs, juveniles, that, or baby ones, or you know, something like that? Would all five or 600 different types have to be taken aboard? No, probably just the created kinds, the basic kinds. It's like saying, would every variety of dog, every breed of dog have to be taken aboard the ark. Now, most of those have come about since the time of the flood. We know that they descended from wolves, and so probably only the wolf kind had to be taken aboard the ark, similarly with dinosaurs. Was there any uh, attempt to check the carbon-14 content of that blood? 
Dr. Schweitzer's discovery. Uh, she said she ran every conceivable test on it. I assume that was one of the tests she ran. I don't know what the results were. I heard stories that dinosaurs might have feathers. Do you think that they might? Well, that's a popular theory that was first proposed back in the 1800s that dinosaurs evolved into birds. And so they say, well, look, we've got dinosaurs around today. They're just a little bit smaller. They've got feathers on them instead. And they have been busily trying to find all kinds of evidence that show dinosaur to bird evolution. Um, back in 1999, there was a famous um, example called Archaeoraptor, and I actually think I have that here. Yeah, I see this paleontologist party games. They're trying to pin the tail on the Archaeoraptor. <laughs> well, Archaeoraptor was supposed to be a transitional form, that is to say, halfway between dinosaurs and birds. And uh, when it was discovered in China back in uh, 1999, they say, hey, look, we've got proof for you of dinosaur to bird evolution that was shipped to the United States and loudly proclaimed by National Geographic that, hey, feathers for T Rex, we've got a dinosaur with feathers. There's only one small problem it was a fake. Somebody had cleverly glued two different fossils together to make it look like it had feathers and it was a reptile also. There have been other um, recent discoveries where they have um, identified what they thought were so-called proto-feathers, but that has been proven. They probably actually were caused by chemical or bacterial action on the rock. So no, nobody has found a dinosaur with, with feathers yet. Question. Um, do you believe that the Loch Ness monster sighting might actually be a dinosaur? Yeah. Okay, another good question. Thank you. The same uh, cryptozoologist that I mentioned that went in search of Mokeli and Bembe also conducted a search of the Loch Ness monster. And he spent, I think, upwards of two years, uh, it was a long time, it was a number of months anyway, out on a boat with sonar gear trying to locate the reputed Loch Ness monster. They never did see it, but he got sonar, you know, what do they call them, sonar graphs or sonar grams, sonograms, whatever the word is, um, of something down there. So it seems that, yeah, there's probably something there. There have been, oh, probably a thousand reports of the Loch Ness monster, Nessie, since World War II. People have reported seeing him coming out across the road, and they'll see him momentary, momentarily out in the water. But of course, you'd have to have a camera just at the right spot at the right time to capture it, so nobody has. There's a famous photo of, reportedly, the Loch Ness monster, you've probably seen it, it looked like a sauropod with a neck sticking out. It turned out that that was a fake. It's a very good fake. It took years before um, the perpetrator finally admitted to it being a fake, so we have no actual photos of it. But there's a chance that there is something there. People say maybe the Lazy Storm, but we don't know for sure. It would be interesting if somebody actually gets a photo. Uh, there are a number of other so-called monsters in other lakes throughout the world, too, including a couple in North America. Is it uh, true that the carbon dating is not effective for such long uh, durations, like millions of years? Yes, that's correct. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,200 and... 5,730, 5, thank you. 5,730 years, which means it can go back to 
50,000 years maximum, theoretically. Uh, even then, though, there are questions. But carbon-14 is for short-term dating. It can only date organic material, that is, material that was once living, and not rocks. For rocks, they use different methods. Radiometric. Radiometric, yes. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody knows this stuff here. <laughs> Yes. In recalling the uh, maps that you had of where fossils have been discovered, uh -huh. can any conclusion be drawn based on those locations where dinosaurs migrating from a central place to, let's say, uh, did they migrate south, did they migrate west? What can we learn from where we have found fossils? Yeah, paleontologists have tried to reconstruct the scenes of what was going on at that time, you know, draw different inferences from the way that the bones were found. But the problem is they are operating on a uniformitarian basis, you know, which says that, you know, the dinosaurs died and then they're gradually covered up over a long period of time and the layers built up and they were eventually fossilized. And so they're assuming that the dinosaurs were fossilized where they died. But if the Bible is right, there was a giant flood, then that would have upset the whole scene. And so we have scenes like um, Dinosaur National Monument. Have any of you ever been there? And they've chipped out from this hillside many hundreds of tons of bones, dinosaurs and other animals, and sent them off to museums. And the interesting thing about this whole hillside covered with bones is the bones are all jumbled up, disarticulated, meaning not where, not joined together the way they originally were. Um, all as if they were washed by a giant wave and all jumbled up after these animals had died and partially decomposed. Um, and so if you think of a giant cataclysm worldwide that com comprised the flood, not just 40 days and nights of rain, you begin to get an idea of what happened. And so with such a worldwide upheaval, it's very difficult to make a conclusion based on all these piles of jumbled bones. Okay, with that, I think we'll wrap up the Q&A, and if you have more questions, of course, uh, Bruce will be around for a bit to... Uh